Hello, I'm Charlotte McLeod, and thank you so much for taking the time to join me here today. I cannot wait for you to meet my special guest. The Australians call her the biggest Hollywood producer working in Australia today. The Americans call her the biggest Australian producer working in Hollywood today. And then if you consider the body of her work, which includes Nine Perfect Strangers, The Undoing, Big Little Lies, The Dry, Penguin, Bloom, Milk, and so many other films and series, I think you'll have to agree that she's probably one of the most important producers working in the world today. Her company, Made Up Stories, puts women at the heart of everything that she does. So I'm not just talking about female-centric stories, but also female actors, female directors, female producers, female creators, females behind and in front of the camera. And in so doing, I think Made Up Stories is redefining Hollywood. She's a force of nature. She's got this energy that would light up a city. And I cannot wait for you to meet the incredible, the wonderful, the brilliant Bruna Papandrea. So, Bruna Papandrea, you wouldn't let anything like a global pandemic stop you. <laughs> You, everyone else is like baking bread and getting stretchy pants and getting depressed. Not Bruna. You're straight in there. I want, I want to talk to you about your absolute first reaction, which was to set up a charity to help the film industry. Oh, you're so nice. No, well, number one, I did actually cook a lot. I just want you to know I did cook more during lockdown than I have cooked in 10 years. Wow. But if I but I did not post fucking pictures about it. <laughs> and if I'd seen one more picture of people making sourdough, I was going to kill myself. <laughs> I just want you to know that up front. Just like, you know. I want you to know, but I was banned from the kitchen. I wasn't even allowed in the kitchen area even to make myself a cup of coffee. Oh, so. my God. <laughs> I, I did. I literally said I cooked and I parented more in that three or four months than I had in six years. So it was quite a triumph lockdown for me. Um, or well, did Abby and Romy kick off and say enough? We've had enough, go back to yeah, yeah, no, I think I think they were like, wow, like, oh, this, they got to know me. They're like, this is the most we've seen you in seven years. <laughs> totally, totally they did. Um, no, it was actually, it was, it was amazing. I've talked to a lot of people about this, right? Like you, suddenly you're just on the move, you're on the move, you're, I was on a plane every week for the last, I don't know how many, 10 years. And suddenly you just can't go anywhere. And it's kind of amazing. And it's kind of great in so many ways. You know, it's, I found it quite liberating creatively to just not be able to go anywhere. So to, to be able to focus on the task at hand. Um, but yes, we're in lockdown. Uh, our nanny moved in with us. I'm just going to be honest about that because I wouldn't have survived lockdown without that because, you know, you have to create a circle because obviously, I mean, I, I literally cannot think of anything worse than having to work and then teach the children as well. And I have a newfound respect for, not that I didn't always appreciate teachers, but man. So our nanny did a lot of that because I found during lockdown we were busier than ever because it's kind of, you know, we we're just in crisis management for the first three I, months. I want to come to the film side of it. Yeah. But I do want to talk about this amazing charity that you set up, It Takes a Day. Yeah. And yeah. how did that happen? I mean, how soon into lockdown did that happen? What was it for? It, it, uh, yeah, it happened very soon actually. And I think like many people, I felt quite helpless. But I also felt very lucky because producers spend so much of their time in development. Like I don't rely on constantly being in production to make a living, right? Because, you know, we, we spend so much of our time kind of incubating stuff and developing that production was, yes, it has to happen for you to survive as a company. But I felt so strongly that these crews who, you know, literally have to be in production to survive, suddenly they just had their, their live stream kind of cut off. Um, and so I, it, it really, it came out of a place of, uh, as you know, we had a, a, a terrible death in my family and that my brother-in-law died very suddenly. And so I think I felt so hopeless about that because I couldn't do anything. I couldn't be with my sister. I couldn't go see her that 
part of me just wanted to, you know, I, I'm one of those people who, you know, I've given to charity over the years, but I, I am one of those people, I'm just going to admit it, who says, oh, I've got to do something, or I've got to go down to the food bank, or I have to volunteer, and I don't do it because I get caught up in my life or I'm too busy parenting or running the business. And so I kind of had that, you know, thing during COVID where I was like, I oh, know I'm going to do it. I'm going to follow through. I'm going to make a plan. And it was really, that's why I kind of pulled together a group of like-minded people to do it with me. Um, so, you know, I immediately reached out to kind of, you know, my friend Molly Allen and Liza and uh, Chasen and my friend Dana Fox, who's a big showrunner. And together we pulled, you know, a bunch of, um, you know, producers, I suppose, and writers and directors. And then my friend Greg Feinberg and Mark Ruffalo were doing, trying to do something similar. So we joined forces and then we created this thing called It Takes Up, It Takes a Village. I think with the goal being to raise like $300,000 that we could give to um, crews through two different organizations that were dispensing money to below the line crews. And yeah, we ended up raising a million dollars. And it was amazing. It was it was amazing. Thanks to some really like generous donations, um, lots of small donations, and then thanks to some big ones from people. But it was amazing just kind of doing that, you know, from home and just kind of having the time to be able to kind of focus on that with this amazing group. So, yeah, um, that was amazing. Yeah. But what was also amazing was that you you talk about crisis management. You had Nine Perfect Strangers, which was your new Leanne Moriarty project with Nicole Kidman, ready to go, ready to shoot. H how many days away when you had to? I mean, on that, we were actually closer on my other show, Pieces of Her, which is a Netflix show with Tony Collette. So with that one, we were literally three days from shooting in Vancouver. Uh, we were a couple of weeks, still four weeks away on Nine Perfect Strangers in California. And then we were a couple of months away on anatomy of a scandal many months but we we had started prep on all three things in London so you know yeah it was like basically I think the biggest one because people were actually in Vancouver was pieces of her because suddenly we'd done the table read everything was about to go and then it was like shut it down I mean the whole world just got shut down so then what what did you do with pieces of her because you're filming that now right is that right yeah, so with everything, we kind of shut it down and then we spent months making sure people were looked after. You know, um, I will say that the companies we were in business with, um, you know, Hulu, Endeavor Content on Nine Perfect Strangers and and then Netflix on my two other shows were amazing. You know, Netflix particularly, they, they, they put a huge amount of money into a production fund to help crews. And, you know, they, they don't, you know, really, there was, you know, if, if, there were some companies, I know this happened, where there was a legal obligation to pay a week or two. But Netflix paid, uh, you know, anywhere from six to eight weeks, you know. Like, they were in enormously, they, they really did the right thing. And so that was great. Um, and I was very happy about that. So, yes, shutting those things down and then, you know, spending the next kind of three months trying to work out how they come back up. But no one really knew, right, what was going to happen because this was the beginning of covid no one knew how long it was going to last, how bad it was going to get. And so you're you're basically putting into, you know, play like A, B, C, D, E, you know, which I realized maybe that I was kind of well suited to that because I was like, well, what real skills does a producer have? But actually I'm pretty good in a crisis. I realized. <laughs> Apart from being bossy. I mean, like, what else? Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. But it, but it did, it did. My survival instinct kicked in, and I am a survivor, as you know. Um, you know, and, and I do have that. Like, okay, well, <clears throat> what are we going to do now? Attitude. So you know, it just became about okay. Uh, piece of her, we were kind of looking at going back to Vancouver, um, and then Nine Perfect Strangers. We Nicole and I quickly you know, talked, we obviously had both deep connections to Australia. The book was originally set in Australia. These places really exist here. And Australia was doing very well with um, COVID. So we said, okay, well, let's see if we can move it. And we just kept kind of making moves very quickly. And, you know, like with everything, a lot of things have to fall into place to make that a reality. And they did, thanks to really Jodie Madison, who is our partner in Australia. If it wasn't for her, it wouldn't have happened, 100%. Like, she's just, like, 
And she's great, you know, yeah. oh, she's great, but she's also just, you know, she just gets stuff done and she's like, okay, here's, here's how this can happen. And so with a lot of minds like that, it did feel like we were in Vegas. Like, you know, we were kind of spending a lot of money to kind of try and make it happen, hoping that it would. And then all the other actors had to decide that they wanted to come, right? Um, so turns, out Australia's, turns out Australia's not so hard, such a hard sell. <laughs> Um, no, the problem is no one wants to leave. Everyone, everyone comes, they don't want to leave. Um, yeah, but Melissa was great and, and everyone was great and everyone either bought their families um, or they followed. And, you know, so we managed, we, we, we knew it was really important to one, keep people safe, but also give them a great experience too if they were kind of uprooting their lives essentially for six months. Yeah, with well, the government. And after three months, I got on a plane without my family and it was the longest I'd left them for. And I think you know including quarantine I was apart from them for two months which was a long time yeah that is a long time and then so not only have you been shooting and and juggling all these different uh, films but you've had two films come out which were the highest grossing box office weekend in Australia's history is that right is that correct so it was the drive kind of, and kind of not right but it's kind I mean it sounds good no yeah they both have been incredible I mean what happened with the movies is they were never supposed to come out obviously anywhere near each other the dates kept moving like everything else and then finally when it looked like the cinemas were going to reopen here um you know I saw it you know in a weird way it's not, it's not good for the exhibitors because like, the, you know, the pipeline is obviously mostly American and international movies, but no one was releasing those movies because, you know, they couldn't release them in the States. So what happened was there was a window at some point in Australia and it meant that both movies could exist at the same time and people went because I think after also having been in lockdown here, people were just dying to have that communal theatre experience. And I just not only did they go, they're still going. I mean, The Dry is in the top 15 Australian movies of all time. I think it's number 14 and climbing. It's still going very strong. Um, I think as of today, it's 18.3 million in, in Australia. Um, and Penguin, which opened you know, many weeks later, is, you know, nearing 7 million and has had a massive release, you know, worldwide on Netflix as well. I have to admit at this point on Instagram, I saw you and Naomi and everyone's post that you were at an open air screening in, and it was snowing here and our numbers were spiking up and we were at an all time low. Everyone was really depressed. It was that post Christmas slump. And there you were at an open air screening and it seemed almost like, yeah. like another world, like another time. Yeah, it feels yeah. like another world. I mean, it still feels like another world every day being here because, and we don't really take that for granted, but it also is like, you know, we're very, um, I'm very conscious and careful of when I talk to other people too, because, you know, for me, the, the beauty of being here is that the kids can go to school and obviously be, you know, I mean, who would have ever thought that that's the thing that, you know, you want to cry when you see your kids interacting with other kids, because going to school was like a gift all of a sudden. And they feel that, which is interesting. Like they want to go. I was like, when do you come up? Well, we're filming at the beach. Come up a day early. They're like, no, we want to go to school. I'm like, oh my God, this is <laughs> number one, great. Um, but it's, it's hard, you know, because we also obviously are deeply connected to a lot of people all over the world. And so, you know, I, I have, I still continue to feel this, you know, low grade depression too, because people, you know, even though things are getting better it's still very much obviously you guys and and in LA people are confined to their houses very hard very hard yeah. but I want to, well I you know knowing you and your superpower energy I kind of was thinking that I've been hearing about these problems with with the power in America and I just thought if only they could just plug you in the whole yeah. Oh, Bruno, Bruno for president. Can't wait. I'm not an American citizen. Otherwise, I think. Probably. And there's yeah. also, a, there'd, there'd be so much scandal on me that I, I think about that. I was like, oh my God, if I ran for politics, can you imagine? They would drag up some major dirt. Yeah. So that's not happening. That's not we'll happening. Have our, we'll have to channel our powers in other ways. Just up. Just up. Just up. Just up.